I'm delighted to be at Reed today, despite the fact that I had to pack my bags and leave the beautiful city of Paris to get here. For somebody who's intensely interested in issues of culture, cultural difference, and what pluralism might mean, to be in Paris right now, it might seem, is to be on the front lines. You know about the four-day crime spree committed a few weeks ago by three young men who claimed to be avenging an insult to the Prophet Muhammad. And for a few caricatures published in a journal that nobody's obliged to read, killed 17 people. Some because they were cartoonists or editors, some because they were Jews buying kosher products, some because they were police and in the way. The city was a strange place during those four days. The shops and streets were quiet. The silence was broken by frequent police sirens. Everybody was following the news, on television, on their smartphones, and by relaying rumors. We weren't sure if that spate of murders wasn't the beginning of a general assault, and were relieved to see that the commandos were a bunch of petty criminals motivated by the same things that motivate American shooters who die in police standoffs. The desire to get on TV, to make a name for themselves, to be action heroes. They had had some training in handling weapons, but were definitely not experts in Islamic history or theology. Once the killing spree was over, the French had to figure out what to make of it. What was it all about? For the Front National, the far-right party that just a few months ago racked up an unprecedented score in the legislative elections, the Charlie Hebdo attacks were about the immigrant problem. In a survey conducted last week, by the opinion pollers Ipsos Sopra Steria, 42% of Front National voters agreed with the statement that France is at war with Islam in general, a proposition that only 16% of the general population found credible. Only 12% of Front National voters find that Islam is compatible with the values of French society. The bright spot is that this overall distrust of Islam is eroding. A year ago, the response to the effect that France and Islam are mutually incompatible was 10 points higher. The task before the French government was to respond to the events, to fix their meaning in a way that would neither play into the hands of the anti-immigrant, anti-European Union challengers, nor stir up the fires of resentment among French Muslims. They identified the murders as an attack on the freedom of expression a principle that has an august history in France and that evokes memories of the struggle against Catholic intolerance under the old regime. The surprise bestseller of the week after the attacks was a reprint of Voltaire's letter on tolerance. By saying, je suis Charlie, one is not saying that one approves unconditionally of everything that Charlie Hebdo published, but that the right to publish materials that offend against or critique anyone's beliefs is not to be restricted. This, I think, was the right tack to take, despite the fact that freedom of the press in France is not absolute and that public religious expression there is limited in ways that we in the U.S. might find insensitive. The proof that this view on the matter was persuasive came when among the two million or so people taking to the streets to show their opposition to intolerance were many who made visible with clothing, flags, or posters their personal identification with Islam. After all, the separation of church and state matters most to members of a minority religion. And it was important to them, I suppose, to testify to their rejection of the kind of defense of Islam carried out by the gun-toting fundamentalists of the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram, as well as to get the jump on that Front National mentality that lumps all followers of the Prophet together. If we were out there attesting to the peaceful coexistence of different religious communities and ethnicities under the general umbrella of the right to free expression, that was a refreshingly problem-free moment in the history of public space. But of course, how long does a political moment stay problem-free? Many of the marchers were carrying French flags. Here and there, a Marseillaise started up Though notably, the volume sank when they got to the verses about soaking the furrows in impure blood. The point of the march was to say that killing people for the sake of religion is not permitted in France. Having sunk from the status of great power to middling power makes French people less inclined than us Americans are, than we Americans are, to think that their job is to lay down the law for the whole world. <laughs> 
Every one of us who had read the morning paper knew that every day in other parts of the world, dozens if not hundreds of people are killed for belonging to the wrong religion or the wrong sect of the right religion. Those 18th century thinkers who insisted on disengaging the state and religion from one another and on the right of everyone to choose his or her form of belief or unbelief haven't been heard by everyone. The movement we, we call the Enlightenment is unfinished business, to quote Jürgen Habermas. Even here in the States with our admirable Bill of Rights, hardly a day goes by without some public official trying to shift the border between church and state in order to comfort his or her favorite religion. How to accomplish pluralism, how to accommodate difference, and when to insist on the irreducibility of differences, and what to do about those differences once they're recognized, these are the problems of enlightenment. You don't have those problems in a theocracy. Yet in that wonderfully positive and consensual march through Paris, I felt the possibility of people drawing the wrong conclusions, the wrong identifications. You might conclude, for example, that freedom of expression is a French value or a European value, an index of the wonderful state of progress to which citizens of Western European nations have advanced, leaving the rest of the world in darkness and terror. You might think, as the Front National voters clearly do, that the presence of ethnics from non-Western European sections of the world is inherently a problem for the security and prosperity of Europe. In statements that people made, and even more in the way some people were quickly rid for their hasty Islamophobic utterances, you saw that the issue of whether the Enlightenment is for everybody or not, whether it is a precious inheritance of Europe or a standard for the whole world, was on people's minds. I think it's good, indispensable even, for Enlightenment to be a controversial value. It's good for it to be confronted with obscurantism, of course. That keeps the intellectual tools sharp. But it's even better for it to be subjected to internal critique and purification, lest we fall into the habit of misidentifying it with a nation, a class, a party, a professional group, or any other already existing thing. There's a long tradition of suspicion that enlightenment is doubled by hypocrisy, pretending to be universal, but really partial and self-serving. And that's my subject today. The possible hypocrisy, the habit of suspicion, and the signs that the suspicion is as old as the Enlightenment itself, as texts can help us to see. If Enlightenment is to be critical and self-critical, it must criticize both its own means, taking the aim of Enlightenment as a given and asking, are those aims accomplished? And, uh, and it must criticize its purposes, asking, is Enlightenment good? One form of critique that has become traditional since the 1970s associates the words enlightenment and universalism. In the age of multiculturalism and small is beautiful thinking, universalism was thought to be a bad thing, not just an epistemological immodesty, but a trick for wielding power over people. I quote, the grand narrative has lost its credibility, whether it's story of speculation or of emancipation, said Jean-François Lyotard in his report on knowledge, The Postmodern Condition, published in 1979. To see Lyotard's suggestion in practice, listen to the view of Gao Xiang, director of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, giving a rather official version of the problem of enlightenment at a conference on the 18th century I attended last year. Here is an extract from his talk, I quote, freedom, democracy, human rights, and other abstract principles advanced by the Enlightenment movement must be keyed to the special circumstances of each individual country. The modern transformation process in the non-Western world by blending Enlightenment with local cultural resources has ceaselessly enriched the content of modernity. To try to force the progress of human civilization into one type of civilization, one type of modernity, is a form of cultural hegemony that we must oppose. Would you like it in Chinese? Huh? Why not? Qi meng yun dong ti chang de zi you min zhu ren quan deng chou xiang yuan ze bi xu jie he mei ge guo jia de te shu guo qing. Fei xi fang shi jie jie he ben tu wen hua zi yuan suo jin xing de xian dai zhuan xing you zai bu duan feng fu zhe xian dai xing de nei han. 试图用一种文化、一种现代性来规制人人类文明的演进，是一种我们必须加以反对的文化霸权。You now have to, to applaud, right? 
No, it's all, no, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I mean, the style, the style is, is very um, you know, it's very, uh, very uh, standard official style. Now, this sounds like special pleading for Chinese behavior regarding freedom, democracy, and human rights, a claim that there aren't actually any abstract principles, but only local cultural resources, and that uniformity of standards in such matters would be tyranny or hegemony, the Chinese official code term for US meddling in other people's affairs. One set of, of enlightenment values, those proclaiming universal rights, here collides with another set, those proclaiming tolerance of difference. Of course, this is too schematic, but you see how a bit of deft navigation will be required to keep the collision from doing too much harm. One will have to show that the universal rights are framed in such a way as not to destroy any essential part of the differences be tolerated, but where passionately held interests and opinions are at stake, this is unlikely to be smooth sailing. Here's another critique of enlightenment. Already during their American exile, Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno were identifying enlightenment's later progeny with instrumental reason and denouncing the crimes committed in its name. They say, uh, you can see the quote up here, right? Uh, Human beings purchase the increase in their power with estrangement from that over which it is exerted. Enlightenment stands in the same relationship to things as the dictator to human beings, right? And this is a rather scandalous thing to be writing in the middle of the Second World War when I think most people would have thought that the dictators were the anti-enlightenment people and the folks who were fighting against the dictators were, were uh, where the possibility of enlightenment was. But uh, a counterintuitive thesis is always more interesting uh, in and of itself. And note that uh, they, they say that the, uh, that the Hitler Youth Organization is not a relapse into the old barbarism, but the triumph of repressive egalite, repressive equality. So rather, rather scandalous uh, set of things to say. The popularity of Horkheimer and Adorno's dialectics of enlightenment in China, uh, as in, in many other places, uh, tracks an intellectual climate in which the paramount issue for many is to resist universalism and champion local exceptionalism. Under those conditions, the Horkheimer Adorno version of history, in which the murder of millions of civilians was not a reversal of the logic of enlightenment, but rather its necessary consequence, acquires a new attractiveness. In such cases, the critique of enlightenment is directed at, it, at its aims and not its mere means. Another form uh, another related form of critique blames the Enlightenment subject for illeg illegitimate claiming universal standing for a particular kind of person. I'm quoting now from a recent book in comparative literature about the Bildungsroman and the idea of human rights by Joseph Slaughter. Uh, he emphasizes the difference between the theoretical human subject and real human diversity, the theoretical person being inescapably the illegitimate universal extension of a highly particular kind of real person. So I quote now Joy Slaughter, the idealist Bildungsroman and international human rights law begin by imagining the normative rights-holding citizen subject, an abstract universal human personality that presumes particular forms of embodiment and excludes or marginalizes others, and that has been historically defined as always already white, propertied, and male. Thus far, uh, Joy Slaughter. The claim of the Enlightenment subject so defined to represent the rest of us, indeed to prescribe what is good for the rest of us, has come in for some well-deserved, for much well-deserved criticism. But the antidote? Perhaps that is to be sought in the very terms of the Enlightenment subject's self-constitution. Stuart Hall supplies this definition. I quote again, uh, the Enlightenment subject was based on a the human person as a fully centered, unified individual endowed with the capacities of reason, consciousness, and action, whose center consisted of an inner core which first emerged when the subject was born and unfolded with it while remaining essentially the same, continuous or identical with itself throughout the individual's existence. The essential center of the self was a person's identity. Now, uh, it, it so happens that Joy Slaughter doesn't quote this passage from Stuart Hall, but when I read the Stuart Hall, I couldn't help thinking this would have been such a wonderful supportive quotation for Joey's argument about the Bildungsroman. You know, I should, I should, have, uh, should have sent it to him. Uh, in, any way, in any case, this is kind of a confluence then of ideas about the Enlightenment subject crystallizing around the notion of personal identity in the Bildungsroman 
being the place where rights land, as it were, where they become real, right? Now, but that, uh, that essential self with a strong center of identity uh, doesn't seem to be a persuasive account of human being in, in our era. Uh, so correspondingly, uh, still quoting uh, Stuart Hall, the postmodern self will be conceptualized as having no fixed essential or permanent identity, formed and transformed continuously in relation to the ways we are represented or addressed. The fully unified, completed, secure, and coherent identity is a fantasy, says Hall in conclusion. So precarious and provisional a self as arises in postmodernity could not be held responsible for any of the misdeeds of the Enlightenment subject, indeed could hardly be held responsible for anything at all. Perhaps most conveniently, no one could accuse a multiple personality like this one of hypocrisy. When the Enlightenment is identified with the West, the potential for detecting sneaky dealing is great. Gyan Prakash finds in the proceedings of early learned societies bringing together British and Indian scholars, I quote, a troubled acknowledgement of the deep-seated incompatibility between modern science's image as free inquiry and its operation as an instrument of colonial domination. On the one hand, science was projected as a universal sign of modernity and progress, unaffected by its historical and cultural locations. On the other hand, science could establish its universality only in its particular history as imperial knowledge, end of quotation. So he's got on the one hand, on the other hand. And as usually happens, there's an asymmetry between the two hands. Science was projected, he says. In other words, it took on certain meanings as an image. But as imperial knowledge, science has, in fact, operation, locations, and particular history, just scrutinizing the language of Prakash's description here. The universality of science is, for Prakash, the stuff of fantasy or delusion, but its role in mastering a colony is realized in concrete space and time, and thus not subject to doubt. The mismatch between fantasy and reality, a favorite rhetorical device of the early Karl Marx, duly receives its Marxian name. I quote again from Gyan Prakash, Insofar as the narrative of progress was compelled to identify knowledge and power in seeking to master the colonized, alienation was a general condition of its articulation. So uh, there we are with alienation. The language of alienation plays on two registers, that of truth, something real is hidden behind something unreal, and that of power, unfreedom is presented as necessary, freedom as impossible. There's an analogy with Hall's two kinds of subject. Hall tells us that the Enlightenment, subject, the Enlightenment self puts forth a fantasy of itself as being one thing, but is in reality something far less consistent and centered. The point of using the word fantasy is to say that it is a deception, a self-deception in the first place and a deception of others thereafter. Similarly with Prakash's review of colonial science, the natives, uh, as he uh, quotes early, uh, British text from India as, as uh, saying, are invited to admire the scientific achievements of the colonizers, to submit to their authority, but not to participate in science as free and equal investigators. Therein lies the hypocrisy of the projection of science as free inquiry under unfree conditions. But what if the terms fantasy and projection were to be replaced with some less suspicious word, word such as template, ideal, goal, or desire? In that case, the Enlightenment subject would not be saying, here is what I am and I shall hold you to the same standard, though you will never reach it, but rather, here is what I am not yet, but hope to be at the end of the process of Enlightenment, which is open for you too. Though both pronouncements could be called universalistic, the first alternative would be dogmatic and uncritical, the second critical and utopian. And as I have suggested, an uncritical Enlightenment would be futile. It may seem over subtle to take so seriously the anti part of a polemic, but it seems to me that the critiques of the Enlightenment subject that blame it for claiming to be an already fully realized ideal miss this element of potentiality, of empty categories waiting to be populated, and commit a kind of essentialism in their characterization of the theories of the subject postmodern people reject. The Enlightenment subject is centered, property holding, male, white. Do you mean by that is and must be, is and can only be, was that way and that's history, 
or do you mean was so but might have been otherwise? Under the first reading, the Enlightenment subject co collapses under the weight of its excessive particularity, for nobody today can be that kind of self-sufficient landed gentleman. Under the second, the place remains open. We'd be wrong, however, to think that the gaps in conceptual coverage that seem so obvious to us were invisible to observers contemporary with the Enlightenment. The native speakers, so to speak, of Enlightenment have much to show us on this score. Olympe de Gouges followed the National Assembly's Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen of 1789 with her Declaration of the Rights of Woman and of the Female Citizen in 1791. Although she insisted on the distinct natures and thus the distinct functions of men and women and even counseled the creation of a separate National Assembly of Women, she had no doubt that woman occupied the position of a rights-possessing subject. Like the anti-hypocrisy forces of today, she accused her fellow revolutionaries of self-contradiction if they were willing to recognize the rights of such formerly subordinate people as male peasants, Protestants, actors, blacks, and Jews, but not of women. Her enlightenment subject is absolutely embodied, assigned by her gender difference to specific functions, such as motherhood and nurturing, in both the natural order and the forthcoming social order. But being thus embodied does not entail any limit on women's right of self-determination. Across the Atlantic and, uh, oops, sorry. Yep, there we go. Across the Atlantic and a decade later, Toussaint Louverture, who is actually not the subject of this picture, I just happen to like the picture. I'll comment on it in a moment. Uh, Toussaint Louverture, having overcome his adversaries, wrote a constitution for the island of Saint-Domingue, Haiti nominally still a part of the French Empire, but practically independent. This constitution of 1801 takes over much of the language of the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man, but adapts it. In particular, it states, I quote, there can never be slaves on the territory. Servitude is forever abolished. All men there are born, live, and die free and French. Every man, whatever his color, is eligible for every kind of employment. No distinctions exist but those of virtue and talent, and no superiority but that granted by law in the exercise of public responsibilities. Here, the logical universals, all man, every man, are introduced and framed by negatives. There can never be slavery. Servitude is forever abolished. No distinctions but, not superiority but. The result is to acknowledge the apparently universal as the result of certain negating events. The Speech Act abolishing slavery and the many feats of arms that gave that Speech Act its force, as well as the Speech Acts and combats that had abolished aristocratic distinctions in the mother country and had been inscribed in the 1789 Declaration. Toussaint's constitution is more historically aware than the Declaration, which had merely set forth the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of man. The French National Assembly in 1789 had perhaps calculated that putting human rights outside of history was the best way to make them invulnerable. For Toussaint and his fellow Haitians, that would have been an impossible act of forgetting. Thus, the Enlightenment subject of the first Haitian constitution is someone who is one rights, who has them as a consequence of an event in recent historical time, but whose possession of them is no less complete than is the case for the Frenchmen or North Americans who had laid claim to them a few years earlier. The man who was just then steering France away from the rule of equality, Napoleon, would disagree and add four more years of bloody war to the Haitian struggle in an effort to keep them enslaved. Toussaint's constitution, although it explicitly maintained Haiti in the French Empire, was in Napoleon's eyes nothing less than proof of treason. To see the place of the Enlightenment subject as an, opening and, uh, as an open and banning one was not without its dangers, dangers confronted not by Toussaint alone, but by an appalling number of victims in Haiti's War of Liberation. Now I'll come in on the picture a little bit. Uh, this is Jean-Baptiste Bellet, who is a, uh, a member of the French Senate from the island of Santo Domingo. And he's, uh, he's dressed in very fine 1790s fashion and leaning on the bust of Reynal, who is the man who wrote the history of slavery in the Americas. And Reynal's history of slavery includes this fam famous paragraph where he says, there are only, you know, only a few thousand colonists and there are hundreds of thousands of slaves. 
who is going to be the man who will put the, the spark to the powder keg, who will rise up in revolt? And the legend has it that Toussaint, who knew how to read, stumbled on that very passage in his master's library when he was a, a servant in a house in Santo Domingo and read that paragraph and said, yeah, that paragraph is about me and got off, hopped on his horse, changed history. It's, it's a legend, but it's a good legend. And obviously the, the, uh, authors, uh, the, author, the uh, artist of this painting thought that it was relevant. And as you can see, it continues to have a kind of recycled life because it was used as the cover image for a uh, catalog of uh, an exhibition entitled Revolution, the Atlantic World Reborn. Whatever the Enlightenment theory of the human subject is, the practice of that theory involves categories and activities not necessarily predicted by the theory. The genderless, ahistorical declaration of 1789 produces a gendered answer in 1791 and a historicized post-slavery answer in 1801. What is the relation between the declaration and these two responses? One could contend that Olympe de Gouges and Toussaint Louverture were rebutting the universalist language of the original declaration, adding something to it that could not have been anticipated by the theorists of the rights of abstract man. To make this contention, however, imp implies accepting the theory that the holder of rights under the declaration is intrinsically and necessarily the free, property-holding, bourgeois, male subject. But Toussaint and de Gouges acted as they did, invoked the language of rights and freedom in the way that, ways that they did from a starting point that did not repose upon that identification. I speculate that if you asked them, they would say that their actions amounted to making real the claims of the earlier document. In other words, that the later dimensions, feminism and emancipation, were implicit, although occluded, in the earlier declaration. The earlier declaration is able to ignore so many things about itself because it precedes the work of building utopia, and the later documents are already engaged in that work. Or to put it somewhat differently, what the 1789 document proclaims as intrinsic qualities of the subject, man is free, turn out to be relations among that subject, other subjects, and material things. That is, if men and women are to make themselves free, they must avail themselves of X, Y, and Z, and do P, Q, and R, and so on. In saying this, I may seem to walk into the crosshairs of Samuel Moyne's recent critique of what he calls the model of universal truncation and subaltern fulfillment of human rights language. Under this model, what de Gouges, Toussaint, and others like them were doing amounted to extending the application of a formal universal. The universal was only potentially universal in its orig original formulation, and it was these marginal uh, or subaltern subjects who made it genuinely universal. As Moyne describes this model, which he finds in the work of many historians of uh, Atlantic revolutions, uh, he says, uh, this model says that the, uh, it is the metropolitan elites who announce universal principles even if they keep them to themselves, and it is the colonial subalterns who become the fulfillers. Moreover, subaltern fulfillment is not mere mimicry, but elevates the principles above their originally bounded announcement in order to make them true for the first time. But according to Moyne, this tempting account of the spread of universal values is strikingly idealist in that it assumes that the role of these agents is that of realizing the concepts already built in potential before subaltern agency arrives. To arrest this creeping Platonism, this determination of a history by ideas, and to give a fuller account of the actual spread of political philosophies, Moyne urges us to direct our attention to the action of subaltern appropriation that selects and reinvents. Subaltern selection and reinvention depend on a range of non-conceptual factors the historian cannot ignore. Quoting Moyne. Fair enough. But the lesson would have on de Gouges or Toussaint, who knew quite well that they were dealing with differently configured human bodies and differently experienced histories of citizenship. Let us therefore stop talking as if the Enlightenment subject were ever, even if falsely, universal and constituted as an essence, and as if post-Enlightenment subjects are particular and constituted by relations. Such unquestionably Enlightenment figures as the two just mentioned can serve to point us the way to seeing the Enlightenment subject in a revisionary, revisionary account as essentially constituted by particular relations that make for the universal effect.
The universal is a normative dimension that constrains the particular relations in which the Enlightenment subject acts. This universal is also, most of the time, new. It forms the principal content of the period's legal and social innovations. Responsibility toward this normative dimension is realized in a juridical norm enunciated by the 18th century constitutions as well as in philosophical and fictional texts, that is, transparency. Now, the 1789 Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, like any document ha hammered out by a committee, reflects many possibly inconsistent points of view. Exactly how the natural rights of man and the national wellspring of sovereignty are to be squared remains a problem. Uh, but they, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man says that sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No one can exercise authority that does not explicitly, expressément, proceed from the nation. And the word expressément uh, is a kind of a self-referential mo moment of language, right? Because explicitly, you, you make explicit something in language. This... Uh, with this word expressément, explicitly, the mysterious sources of rights and power are pushed into the background and the exercise of power is made subject to a linguistic demand that can be voiced by any challenger. If you are claiming authority to do something, you must express the relation to the national will that justifies your claim. Article 1 says, uh, of the, the Declaration says, social distinctions can be based only on public utility. The limits on any man's ex exercise of natural rights can be determined only by law. Right? These are two more versions of the demand for public acts of justification. Uh, taxation must be equitably imposed and evaluated and consented to publicly. Right? Taxation was, as with the American revolutionaries, a big issue. Uh, Toussaint's Constitution of 1801 is even more detailed in this demand of transparency. It says, notably, no one can be arrested but by virtue of a formally stated order issued by an officer to whom the law gives the right of making arrests and detaining prisoners in a publicly designated place. Right? So in that one sentence, you have four or five appeals to publicness and to uh, documentation. Uh, every person's house is an inviolable refuge. Anyone who in the absence of legal power to arrest orders, signs, performs, or has others perform the arrest of any person will be guilty of the crime of arbitrary detention, says Toussaint's constitution. Right? So before arresting anyone, the officer must make known to the detainee the grounds of his own authority and the reasons for the detention and leave behind a written copy of those reasons. Okay? So more gestures demanding transparency and reasons for action. Now, transparency in these cases involves a demand to show, to make public, the legal basis of any act that limits the freedom of individuals. It is not a metaphysical issue, but a practical one. When an individual is wrongly arrested, or taxation is carried out arbitrarily, such an illegitimate exercise of public power is shown to be criminal by the inability of the perpetrator to render a satisfying public account of the sources of the authority he claims. The obligation of transparency on the part of public officials implies respect for the equality of all citizens. It also reveals a mutuality among all citizens in that any person can demand that the relation to the law be made manifest. Transparency is a criterion for what will make law lawful in the new order of things that the French Declaration and the Haitian Constitution sketch out. Transparency in public function is imagined to be the only and the sufficient protection from arbitrariness. On the other hand, private citizens are not obliged to render up accounts for every act of their will, for, I quote, no action may be prevented that is not forbidden by the law. What triggers the demand of transparency is the relation to sovereignty. The demand for transparency is the operative thing here. A concept of transparency had existed, of course, for centuries. Look back to St. Paul, Augustine, and others. An institutionalized demand that made the legitimacy of political action hinge upon the transparency or, of its content or motives was a novelty of the societies that sought to replace the ancien regime, where the right to act was based on privilege, birth, or connection. Well, transparency is, of course, a, process, a, a property of utterances, of documents, of speech acts. 
and it has a particular affinity with certain kinds of writing. If there is ever a kind of literature whose reader is justified in demanding transparency, it is the how-to book. A recipe that omits important ingredients is not actually the recipe it claims to be. Books of instructions succeed or fail by their explicitness and accuracy. Two of the characteristic genres of 18th century writing, the epistolary novel and the political constitution, derive from the how-to book, but take separate paths. In fact, uh, I tend to think that the epistolary novel is something like the problematic shadow of the constitution as a genre. The latter fetishizes transparency, the former makes a problem of it. Now here's the connection to how-to books. The printer Samuel Richardson began writing long prose in order to cash in on the demand for books of model letters, instruction manuals for social performance. A typical book in this genre showed readers, through examples, how to compose a letter of recommendation, a job application, a letter of condolence, and the like. Richardson swerved from being a provider of useful information into being a novelist when he began to frame letters that suggested more than they said. In other words, when the transparency of his model letters could no longer be assumed. His novels won sympathy for his heroines Pamela and Clarissa by making them first the narrators of their own stories in the presumably truthful form of letters to an intimate friend, and second, the victims of machinations carried out by a more powerful male character whose motives were never assumed to be as they seemed. In this illustration from the 1742 version of Pamela, you have Pamela who has written a letter to her friend and the, this letter is being intercepted by Mr. B, who is sort of the, the, uh, the, the man who is illegitimately pursuing her and about whom she complains in her letters. Right? So here's a, a moment of involuntary disclosure. Richardson's heroines, lower or middle class women pursued by wicked upper class men, dramatized the how-to book's strivings to earn a degree of nobility through its promotion into narrative romance. Presented to a public of relatively plebeian readers, the self-revealing letter writer entered fiction with an automatic credit of virtue. The competition of transparency and non-transparency created rhetorical suspense, a trick exploited by further authors in the epistolary genre. In this genre, inequalities of privilege are reinscribed as inequalities of access to information. Valmont and Merteuil in Les Liaisons Dangereuses invent a series of intrigues where it is clear that they get more pleasure from ruining their victims' reputations than from contact with their bare flesh, and Laclos' choice of the epistolary device, allowing us to eavesdrop on the plotters' scheming while their victims are all unaware, deepens our sense of their wickedness. Moments in these novels when the assumption of transparency is confounded by allegory or dissimulation point to a critique of manipulation. When the plotters succeed in carrying out their plans, the result is a violation of mutuality through pretense and secrecy. Had the exercise of power infallibly been conditioned on transparency, none of these plots would have run their course. Thus, transparency is put into the position of precondition for mutuality and equality, the state toward which Richardson's novels steer. Um, in short, from the self-revealing characters to the schemers and the hypocrites, 18th century fiction explores epistemological and moral questions, as well as its own representational techniques, by raising the topic of non-transparency as a flaw in an assumed normative basis of open and transparent communication. The Haitian constitution designed by Toussaint here reveals its other side, for in addition to containing a set of prescriptive statements about the legitimacy of actions to be undertaken in the name of the law, statements having a general and, and predictive force, it contains a description of the role of its one true narrator and a kind of epistolary fiction addressed to the future inhabitants of Haiti. Although slavery is repealed and no distinction of status will be allowed except those gained through virtues and talents, the Constitution specifically ordains an unequaled, nearly royal degree of authority to its governor, Citizen Toussaint Louverture, General-in-Chief for the rest of the, his glorious life. The governor seals and promulgates the laws. He names all civil and military officials. He submits legislation, as well as future constitutional amendments, to the assembly for approval. He sees to the application of the laws, etc. The, calculation, the calculus of the separation of powers does not in the least apply. Supposing in the future the citizens call on their greatest protection, 
their constitutional right to demand a basis for authority anytime someone compels them against Toussaint's special privileges, they will receive no response but repeated citations of the text attributing to Toussaint almost unlimited powers. Only slavery is forever abolished. I read from Title VIII of the 18.1 Haitian Constitution. To confirm the tranquility that the colony owes to the decisiveness, the activity, the tireless zeal, and the rare virtues of General Toussaint Louverture, and as a sign of the unlimited confidence of the inhabitants of Santo Domingo in him, the Constitution exclusively attributes to this general the right of choosing the citizen who, in the sad event of his death, will instantly replace him. His choice will be secret enclosed in a sealed packet that can be opened only by the Central Assembly in presence of all active service generals and the commanders-in-chief of the departmental militias. General Toussaint Louverture will take every necessary measure of precaution to inform the Central Assembly of the place where this important packet is deposited. At the core of the Constitution then, notwithstanding all its gestures of legitimation in the terms of transparency and accountability, lies a sealed packet in a mysterious hiding place addressed to the nation and containing its future. The Central Assembly, like a good postman, is empowered to carry the letter but not to open it. The author of the letter is utterly unconstrained by any of the institutions that he establishes. Is this an Enlightenment subject? Toussaint writes an Enlightenment Bill of Rights, establishing for his fellow citizens the minimum requirements for being the subject of rights, and follows it with the first post-Enlightenment Constitution, one that grants him virtually unlimited authority to act. It even goes beyond the term of mortality. Not just a personal right to rule, but the right to name his successor are justified by reference to individuality, that is, the, the historical deeds of a singular founder. The public demand to show the law here ends with the sealed packet. Now, Enlightenment constitutions and fictions, as we've seen, put much faith in transparency. It is expected that transparency will, in and of itself, forestall injustice. But in our time, transparency has taken on a different set of connotations. It is related most often to bribery. Consider Transparency International, to the discovery of conflicts of interest, and to a whole dynamic of intervention of, in political life of investigation based on the suspicion that things are not as they seem. We have recently become aware that our private lives are not so private as we thought, that our electronic and other communications are always at least potentially observable by agents of the state in the name of security. The panopticon, once a philosopher's fantasy, then a historian's accusation, has become as banal as email. But try to extract yourself from the line of sight and you will only convince someone that you have something to hide. The demand for transparency draws its energy from the hypocrisy plot, from the belief that the overt and public side of diplomacy, legislation, or business is not self-explanatory, but that it ought to be. It is therefore not entirely at home in the domain of the formally specified institutions of politics, but must always be mucking about in the shadow zone between public actions and private, undisclosed interests. And for this reason, it is a demand that often takes extra legal form outing of the private lives of citizens who for some reason have irked a powerful person or a numerous mob, smear campaigns, conspiracy theories, and other artifacts of a highly mediated life. Immanuel Kant is famous for insisting that one should never on any pretext tell a lie, even when being interrogated by a murderer intent on killing one's close friend. His readers note with dismay that this example ranks transparency higher than the pres preservation of life. Kant also condemns practices such as appending secret clauses to treaties or tacitly reserving the grounds for future war. Both state and individual seem to be tr summoned to transparency in the following passage from Perpetual Peace. If in consideration public right as the jurists usually conceive of it, I abstract from, from it uh, all its material aspects, I am left with the formal attribute of publicness. For every claim upon right potentially possesses this attribute, and without it there can be no justice, which can be conceived of only as publicly knowable, and therefore no right, since right can only come from public justice. Every claim upon right must have this public quality thus far 
Öffentlichkeit is here nearly synonymous with justice, which puts it very high indeed. But this insistence on transparency, come what may, strikes many as naive. Committed modern day Kantians have attempted to work around the prohibition against lying. Christine Korsgaard proposes considering lying under the heading of something analogous to Kant's laws of war, special principles to use when dealing with evil, and therefore not coming under a universal requirement. She also proposes taking inspiration from Rawls and reformulating moral duty as a double level theory with one level being applicable under ideal conditions and the other under non-ideal conditions. But to have one rule for dealing with the good and another for dealing with the bad raises the question of how the distinction is to be made and whether the grounds of distinguishing are available for public inspection. I, I fear that Kant would have responded to the idea that all's fair, even lying in love and war, with a reiteration of his transparency demand. As he puts it, all actions affecting the rights of other human beings are wrong if their maxim is not compatible with their being made public. In other words, I could lie to the inquisitive murderer only if I made public my grounds for considering him undeserving of the right to hear the truth from me. This hardly simplifies things. Indeed, one effect of the double bind of transparency is to make rebellions impossible. Uh, Kant says, the injustice of rebellion is thus apparent from the fact that if the maxim upon which it would act were publicly acknowledged, it would defeat its own purpose, says Kant, apparently relieved to have put that danger at a distance. Transparency of motive is no guarantee of fair dealing, however, for there remains the case of the outright bully. I quote Kant again, we cannot simply conclude by a reverse process that all maxims which can be made public are therefore just, because the person who has decisive supremacy has no need to conceal his maxims. But it seems unlikely that anyone would have the decisive supremacy in such measure as to permit complete transparency about unjust intentions. To revert to Toussaint's constitution, the fact that the founding governor refuses to name his successor right here and now, but will do it only in a post-mortem message, indicates that tranquility is not yet a sure thing, because presumably the named successor would rise up against the founder or himself be attacked by rivals for the position. The need to conceal is an underhand acknowledgement of the authority of legal publicness. Kant's final transcendental and affirmative principle of public right is to say that all maxims which require publicity, if they are not to fail in their purpose, can be reconciled with politics, presumably meaning that they can be reconciled with a moral politics aimed at achieving the happiness of the citizens. What then could be more moral than publishing? How two books, the most moral kind of book, make explicit the steps that need to be taken in order to get from a state of lack to a state of having. The various bills of rights require the making of public of authority, and the novels of hidden intrigue perform, in the double perspective of dramatic irony, the making public of motives to the reader. All then aim at a satisfaction of the need for transparency. Quoting Kant again, for if they can only attain their end by being publicized, they must conform to the universal aim of the public, which is happiness, and it is the particular aim of politics to remain in harmony with the aim of the public through making it satisfied with its condition. But the further elaboration and discussion of the form of universal lawlessness must wait, he says, for another occasion. Right, this is a frequent gesture in God. He says, this is a very interesting question. I'll deal with it later. And then you're left wondering when he's going to deal with it. Well, the drafts published much later. Ah, sorry, you didn't know that Immanuel Kant invented the t-shirt, did you? Here you are. Uh, the drafts published much later as Kant's opus posthumum, and here's a page from the manuscript. Uh, the editors are, are greatly to be admired and pitied. Uh, give some idea of how he would have done this further elaboration and discussion. Here we have only fragments, repetitive and often grammatically incomplete, so any idea of the system they would have pointed to must be conjectural. Kant is concerned to locate moral authority properly, not in the use of force, but in the consent of the subject to an imperative that he recognizes is coming from reason disguised as the voice of God. I quote, the categorical imperative represents all human duties as divine commands, not historically, as if God had ever issued certain orders to man, but as reason presents them through the supreme power of the categorical imperative, 
in the same manner as a divine person can rigorously command submission to himself. So reason's demands issue in the same manner as those of a divine person, which is not to say that any divine person ever actually substantively or historically appears to utter them. So there's, there's a doubleness here, an element of masquerade, right? We're going to behave as if some divine person had ordered this, but in fact, we, we don't have to assume that that is true. Uh, as for this divine person, Kant explains a little bit further in the Opus Posthumum. The commanding being is not outside man as a, diff as a substance different from man. It is rather the counterpart to the world represented as the complex of sensible beings. Both together, in, both together in one system, however, and related to each other through one principle, are not substances outside my thought, but rather they are the thought through which we ourselves make these objects through synthetic a priori cognitions from concepts and subjectively are self-creators of the object's thought. God, the world, both outside me, and the rational subject which connects both through freedom, not substance. Okay, this is you know, extraordinarily condensed and he's, he's basically giving you the whole argument of the critique of pure reason in one sentence. So if it didn't make sense, there's a reason for that. But I'm giving you a sense of how at the end of his of his life, Kant is trying desperately to roll it all into one package so that you get the, you know, the three critiques all somehow uh, coinciding and fitting together like pieces of a puzzle. Uh, as do the analytic of the sublime or the idea of a teleology of nature, the command serves as a means of discovery of freedom in the subject, going beyond the bounds set to every natural or theoretical conception. The explanation of the idea of God takes for Kant quasi-constitutional form. God has the unusual legal status of a being who is all obligating but is not obligated in any relation. The starting point of this reasoning seems to be the status of the human in society uh, as having some rights and some duties. Reasoning by analogy and antithesis, I quote again from Opus Postuum, God is a being who contains in his concept only rights and no duties. World is the opposite. Person is a being who has rights and is conscious of them. If he has rights and no duties, then he is God. To have duties and no rights is the characteristic of the criminal, categorical imperative of the highest being. Okay, again, some very condensed language there that I'll try to unpack. The criminal is a kind of human who began with rights and obligations, lost his rights, and was left with nothing but obligations. A position like that of world, that is, mechanical nature, absent the idea of freedom. Neither God nor the criminal is a genuine enlightenment subject, but both are related to one. Is that the right page? Hang on. Um. Contrary to the usual denunciations, the Enlightenment subject is a constituted one. It's subjecthood results from relations to others. We have here one of the most glaring examples. Seeking to synthesize morality, cosmology, and the categories of a priori reason in a single figure, Kant seized on the model of a constitution, that characteristic Enlightenment-era document that spells out transparently, if not always mutually and equitably, the relations of right and obligation that will hold among citizens. It appears as if Kant was trying to draft the constitution of the universe, a project that would make sense only in an era that believed in such founding declarations. The drafts of Opus Postumum include many paragraphs beginning, transcendental philosophy is the signs of an attempted final summation. One of these proposes that, I quote, God and the world are the two objects of transcendental philosophy. Thinking man is the subject predicate, and copula, the subject who combines them in one proposition. Both the constitution and the sentence need publicity. They need to be uttered, to be performed, to accomplish their ends. If it was an act of extraordinary immodesty to write the constitution of the universe, perhaps that could be justified as an effort to show communication itself as the necessary form of universal lawfulness an ultimate carrying out of the duty of transparency on behalf of that mediator whom Kant calls the subject. So it appears from this review of a select body of texts that the values often presented as universal, indeed as the very expression of enlightened universalism at its most unrestrained, 
do something other than or in addition to propounding universal maxims. They articulate relationships. They are sensitive to the ways that a single relationship, for example, that of transparency, takes on a different value depending on whether we come to it from one side, say that of the citizen demanding to know what his government is up to, or from the other, say that of the government demanding to know what the citizen is up to. To take account of this, our understanding of the Enlightenment must become more searching and suspicious, as well as broader and less dogmatic. The subtler, more specific sense of the universal as one aspect of a relationship will not typically be given in the declarations and proclamations to which Enlightenment political theory is so well known. We have to seek them out in less notorious, less showy places, such as epistolary novels, or in the political philosophies designed by members of groups conscious of their disadvantaged status, or in such works of, of science fiction as Kant's allegation of rights and duties among the ultimate constituents of the universe. The reward for doing so is an enlightenment that is less blind than we moderns and postmoderns may like to think, a challenge to our condescension and a worthy debating partner. Thank you very much.